Hi, this is Kevin Stroud from the History of English podcast, and you're listening to the Southern Fried Philosophy podcast. We want to say shout out to our sponsors, Watchman Cigars, 1812 Barbecue, Blue Collar Cycle Shop, and Hook, Line, and Heroes. Without you, this episode would not be possible. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast, where it's our take on life, liberty, and the pursuit of gravy, while you, the listener, are getting a degree in common sense. We are broadcasting from our Blue Collar Bunker Studios right here in the Charlotte area studios. Uh, We've got a great show lined up for you, as always. But before we begin, let me introduce you to our starting lineup. Magic Man, now you hear him, now you don't. What up? Magic Man. Greetings, everyone. And, of course, behind the plexiglass in his own studio, it is producer Brian. Hey, guys. I, of course, be your host, Biggin, and how about you? And across the way is the pride of Anderson, South Carolina, but most of you probably know him best as the Silver Tongue one, 2016's honorable mention, uh, Patient Zero of the Year, <sighs> the inventor of the redneck egg roll, Give it up on old mic number one. It's Mojo! How about you, buddy? Welcome to the Southern Fry Philosophy Podcast. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, if you tuned in before, we appreciate it. New listeners, we appreciate you out there. We're all weathering this uh, epidemic, pandemic, the coming of Christ, or apocalypse, whatever. Uh, yeah, appreciate, appreciate you tuning in. Go to our website at southernfriedphilosophy.com. You can also find us on the uh, uh, on the interwebs at southernfriedphilosophy.com. We do have our playable links. They are suitable for work for those out there uh, still working. Uh, just go there, hit the uh, episode that you want to listen to. You can also find our show notes there. Um, you can play. <laughs> you have our playable links there, um, our show notes. Also, our sponsors. You can check those guys out. Um, also go to, uh, Twitter's and Instagram at SFP radio. You can uh, follow us there. Uh, we try to post as much as we can, especially our new episodes. Um, wherever you listen to your podcast, just go there, hit subscribe, uh, give us a follow, give us a review and a rating. And we appreciate all the new listeners. We keep getting all over the world while you're bunkered down. Guys, it feels like as we try to figure out this new technology and then just, you know, technology, how it is, you know, glitchy and whatnot, it feels like I'm 16 years old again, trying to drive a stick, (laughs) 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 you know, getting that back and forth. It is. So we apologize for the lag. We are doing the very best we can. Um, but no doubt you guys are sitting at home. You ain't got nothing else to do. You probably think to yourself, these guys are idiots. You are correct. That is correct. Uh, And I can do a show better than these guys. That's also probably correct. Um, Why don't you um, start trying to do a podcast? You could do your very own. And if you need some help and need some editing, uh, check out our producer, Brian. You can email him at headlines at sfpradio.com, and he can make your voice sound glorious, sexy, buttery smooth, whatever you want to call it. Um, He can do that for you. So we appreciate producer Brian and all that he does for us. And if you have a podcast and a podcast idea, hit him up and he can uh, definitely help, help you out through that process. Sure. Can. Thank you, producer Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you guys, like I ask you every week, how you be darn? Who's going first? I can go first. All right. Do it. So, uh, I either, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die now. Like I have, uh, it's either going to be the COVID-19 or maybe botulism. Sure. <laughs> I, I I went to the, the grocery store on Wednesday, yesterday, yesterday morning. Okay. During the time, like, the you know, there's certain times you can go and there's nobody there. Oh. So I figured what, what that out. That? Really? I'm not going to tell. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> this was oh, like yeah. between 8 Good and 8.30 call. on a Wednesday. So there's, there's stock in the shelves. There's, there might have been six people, seven people in the whole store that weren't working there. Wow. And four of them were firemen altogether. So there was like nobody in the store. Wow. Uh, so 
I don't know if anyone else has uh, uh, trouble um, with that, but uh, with, with uh, so I was the produce section. This is what I was doing. Okay. Um, the little green bags, you know, that you put your produce right. in. Yeah, I can't open those to save my life. Like, no, I just I can't do it. So I'm standing there, you know, there's not a lot of people around, Mm -hmm. but I, uh, so I'm trying to get this, I'm looking around, see if anyone's watching me. The only way I can get these bags open is by licking my fingers. Sure. Yeah. Right. And it's like 2020. That's the last thing you want to do in a public place, right? Is lick your fingers Mm -hmm. and grab the plastic and try to get open. So the first bag, I I spent at least five minutes. I'm glad it wasn't crowded because I look like a total moron. Cannot open this bag. (laughs) I throw it in the trash and grab another one. This one still will not open. So I'm like, ah! So I'm like licking my fingers. Finally, I get it up, get, put my garlic in the bag. Okay, it's over. Then I realize I'm getting like 12 produce things, right? So this is not oh, going to end. No. But fortunately, like the next, um, when I went to, the next roller was easy. It just like came right apart. Maybe my fingers were still moist or something. I don't know. But yeah, so the 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 punchline is I'm going to die. So Sure. Oh, that's that's yeah. clear. But can you maybe bring like your own spray bottle of water next time, so you don't have to lick your own fingers? Come a little bit more prepared. Yeah, I could probably bring like a a sponge, like a wet sponge, and like mm. an Altoids tin. There you go. Do it that way. Like Alton maybe. Brown brings his uh, soap everywhere. Yeah, goes. exactly. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that'd be so, good. Yeah, that's that's my adventure this week. It's the only time I left right. the house, so it was real exciting. <laughs> but I did find chicken. Did you? Atta yep, boy. fresh. I like was stalking the guy, putting it on the shelf. Like he rolled his big metal container, he filled it up, and I just stuck it behind <laughs> him and emptied the shelf. Not Let quite, me ask but. you this: uh, Four weeks ago, did it ever cross your mind that you may be stalking a the the butcher so that he could put out chicken so you could be the first one to grab it? Did that ever cross your mind four weeks ago? Not me. No. 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 It blows my mind how four weeks ago and the world is completely different. I just well, we're all we're all insane. we all feel like we're in Venezuela right now, waiting for the bread truck to pull up the bread lines, and just you know trying to. I, I, I mean, how many how many people go to the grocery store every day, like in a scavenger hunt, to see if they can find something else? Yeah. Right. It's yeah, crazy. and they're out of stuff that I never would have expected. I just didn't think about them being out of. Like yeast for bread, like just like packets of yeast and the jar of yeast. None of that. Everyone's making pizza apparently because they're not because bu- even like the pre-made dough was all gone. Or they're yeah. making their home homemade beer kits or liquor with yeast oh, or something. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's possible. Yeah. Mojo, how you be doing? Uh, I'm uh, I'm good. I'm still waiting on my uh, 25 year shelf life food to uh, to come in that I ordered like seven weeks ago, but. You know, oh, no. it's not keto friendly either. But hey, you know, in a pinch, <laughs> still waiting on it. The apocalypse isn't keto friendly, I think. <laughs> no, uh, you, you, I have found myself eating more comfort foods than anything else mm. here lately. And I hate yeah. that because I was doing so good. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I just every day around 12 o'clock, I get a hankering for a Chick fil A sandwich or a cheeseburger. So I. And that hankering usually wins out over uh, me staying lean. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, SFP healthy is now going to become SFP. I'm just trying to survive at this point. I th- yeah, I think it's like day <laughs> day number six hundred in quarantine. Still no COVID. That's probably a good update. So <laughs> right. yeah, would you rather have COVID or carbs? That's mm. your. <laughs> that's, a good- <laughs> that's a good hashtag. It's a good one. Yeah. Oh, uh, Magic Man, how you been? Doing? Um, I've been doing good. Uh, still working from home. Got a uh, message from the uh, CEO yesterday saying that uh, the company will still institute a work from home policy for the rest of the month. So I'll be working from home for the rest of the month. Unfortunately, my wife still has to go into where she works. Uh, she uh, manufactures throat lozenges and cough drops and other OTC over the counter medicines. So that's considered essential. So she has to darn right it go is. In, yeah, has to go in for work for that, hoping the she doesn't catch anything from any of her coworkers if they bring anything in. Mm. Um, but you know, something I've noticed today, um, I, I, at lunch, I, I decided to kind of get out for a second. I went to a, a McDonald's to get some lunch uh, nearby. 
Yeah, it was nearby. It was a quick one. Um, I've noticed that the traffic lights are timed horribly now um, <laughs> because the traffic patterns aren't the same that they used to be. So, you know, if you're on a, on a crossroad from a main road, you just sit there and you sit there mm-hmm. until several people come up to trip the sensor and then it finally lets you go. So, I mean, there's a couple places where I would sit there for three to five minutes before it finally let me go. It's kind of crazy. Does it help if you just like go put it in reverse and then move forward and just keep going back and forth? <laughs> I tried. I tried. Yeah, Still it didn't, didn't work. work. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. You should be a rebel, um, rebel, Ryan, is, and just burn through it. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> I was doing that before the pandemic. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Big, and how about you? Um, guys, I've been trying to pass the time trying to I – mean, we've got Small Batch and, and Hot Pocket and – I'm just trying to survive at this point, you know, like I need something that's going to give me some, some, something to look forward to each day. And I was watching CNN and they were talking about how stocks have just dramatically dropped. And I said to myself, this is going to be a great time for me to get in the stock market. I mean, why not? So I downloaded this, this app called Robinhood, thanks to Mojo. And I decided I'm going to start investing in, in stocks, but I'm going to do like the, the, the small penny stocks and I'm only giving myself just like a couple hundred bucks. Like I'm not going all crazy or whatnot. Um, I put the link to Robin hood, uh, my special app, my special link uh, on the show notes. So when you, when you listen to it, you can download it, you get a free stock and I get a free stock. So yeah, might as well. <laughs> um, but if you're going to do it, I mean, this honestly is, is, giving me so much entertainment throughout the day because I'm just flipping through and I'm like, Ooh, I made 15 cents. I'm feeling awesome. <clears throat> the first day I made 20. I thought about cashing out and buying a pizza. I mean, that was fantastic. Next day didn't do so well. I lost seven, but it's entertaining. It's at least giving me something to look forward to at nine o'clock when the stock market goes on. I'm like, yes, here we go. Let the ponies run. So I am excited about that part. Um, so anyway, if you want to try it, you should uh, you should uh, give it a shot. So the other thing too that I wanted to point out and ask you guys this is um, I noticed on on the Cabarrus Health Alliance um, there was a it, two days ago it said that there were forty four cases um, of COVID nineteen in Cabarrus County. It said forty four cases, two deaths, and three recoveries. I was like, okay, all right. The first time I've ever seen recoveries on the website, Cabarrus Health Alliance. Then, today, I pull it up. 57 cases, two deaths, zero recoveries. What happened to the recovery people? Where did they go? Did they go back into the cases? I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. So, I think we're kind of like China. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. We're fudging the numbers, guys. What are your thoughts? Maybe all three of those people got hit by cars. (laughs) (laughs) They were on the same bus that collapsed. I got you. It'd be interesting to reach out to Cabarrus Alliance and just ask them about that. I've always, I've also had a question on how they track recoveries because I, you know, just like everyone, Mm -hmm. you kind of look at the daily numbers um, just to kind of see where, if we're plateauing or not, I, I just, I'm kind of curious that you just want to see if we're plateauing and we can get back to some sense of normalcy. Um, but the amount of recovered is, is slowly going up. I think we, on worldometers.info, we've kind of, we finally crossed the threshold over a million cases of COVID worldwide, but we only have less than 200,000 recovered. So mm. are they tracking the, like if someone gets, you know, diagnosed with it and they send them home for 14, 15 days to self quarantine. Do they follow up with them in 15 days and say, Oh yeah, well, you know, John Smith is mm. recovered to end. Let's add that to the tally. Yeah. So huh. I don't know. I'd be kind of curious. I'm sure Cabarrus County, as small as it is, could keep track of that. I would hope. It, you would think. Yeah. But you never know. They, they, they went interdimensional and left this plane of existence. You know, the, those three people, who knows? Yeah. No, it's it's odd that that's that's happened. Um, so, 
our special guest tonight is going to be Kevin Shroud. Um, Mojo, you started listening to his episode, The History of English. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I look like an English major. So, uh, you do. I naturally gravitate towards a <laughs> podcast that talks about the foundation and where modern language speak comes from. So, it's just, it, I don't know. I sometimes I get on these little rabbit hole trails and I, I came across this podcast from actually through another podcast. Um, just if very fascinating, just we, we kind of wonder, I, I don't know. I've always been fascinated with language. Like it's interesting watch a, watching a baby, uh, pick up on language, you know, like mm-hmm. how do they, it just fascinates me how they formulate sentences, put phrases together, recognize what words mean, what, you know, my seven year old misuses words. So it's kind of fascinating to see you know, the, the, the progression of like the language kids. So I've always been fascinated with, and especially now in, in, in our lifetime, we've, we've seen words that were part of our nomenclature, uh, that were acceptable, you know, 10 years ago. Now they're not acceptable. They're now mm-hmm. words that are considered, you know, trigger words or whatever. So it's just, it's just interesting to see the progressive language. So I've always thought about, well, I wonder how, you know, words come to be. And it's just, I don't know. The podcast is very fascinating to me. I mean, it's, uh, he, Kevin also has one of those ASMR voices. So, you know, if you, <laughs> right. it, That's true. It, it, it's very relaxing. He does a great job presenting uh, the facts and the history of it, but um, you can also kind of get lost into it. I've had to rewind some of the episodes before, cause you know, you'll kind of just kind of me when I listen to it, when I'm driving. So <laughs> kind of get lost into it and you have to, so you have to rewind when you hit the little road bumps, yeah, like, yeah. oh, wait a minute, what was he saying? Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> no, wait. Because you kind of, you know, you kind of, <laughs> you kind of lose track of where he's at. So it's, it's just fascinating. Yeah. Have you guys listened to the, to the episode or to, to the podcast? I went through, I got through about half an episode today, this afternoon while I was working on some stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it sucked me right in. So yeah. Is the first few minutes I was like, okay, what's how, what's this going to be like? And then next thing I know it's 45 minutes have passed and I'm <laughs> like, wow. I was like the playing card ones. So like the most recent one, I guess. Okay. I was, I was, well, you got yeah, to start at the beginning. I, I'm not a completionist. You got it. You got it. <laughs> it's, I, I There's 140, 137 or something like that. 135. Yeah. Here's the thing. I and mean, we may get into this with when he's on later, but I did the math because, you know, I love math. <laughs> and he, he releases a podcast once a month. Because math is hard. Yes. Right. 11 years he's been making these podcasts based yeah, on if, if he's been doing them one a month. I didn't look to see if he actually been going that far, but, um, 11 years that's nuts that's commitment y'all right that's that's some commitment there's no way we're doing this for 11 years so (laughs) (laughs) that's funny we probably aren't i'm look i'm shocked that we're at four four years like i'm i'm blown away um by the way we've got more episodes than he does i'm just saying it's not it's not a competition (laughs) but but it is winning we should look at probably quality he's probably has more quality episodes than those so I guarantee you he has more listeners than us. <laughs> the 1812 Barbecue Story started over 20 years ago when Eric and his dad started entering local barbecue competitions for fun. During that time, Eric, a United States Marine, has traveled all over the world picking up flavors and techniques that today is the unique flavor of the award-winning 1812 barbecue. He has honed his craft to bring you fall-off-the-bone pulled pork, mouth-watering ribs, and finely crafted beef brisket. Eric has developed his own amazing dry rub and delicious barbecue sauce. And let's not forget the sides. Coleslaw, smoked Gouda mac and cheese, cowboy baked beans, and to top it all off, banana pudding and pecan pie for dessert. Getting hungry yet? Good. Call or email Eric at 1812barbecue, and he can make your next catered meal happen. Wedding and graduation parties, family reunions, and other events will be memorable with 1812 Barbecue. Want to try your own hand at smoking meats? Pick up your own 1812 dry rub and start the journey for yourself. Shipping all over the world, connect with Eric on his Facebook page, Instagram at 1812 Barbecue, or call 704-604-5148 or email eric at eric.line at 1812barbecue.com and he'll be glad to help any way he can. Um. We we did we did 
try to start this whole thing again, uh, broadcasting from our bunkers last week. So, Producer Brian, you worked your tail off to try to get the the audio and everything up and running. So, uh, hopefully, at this point, it'll be a seamless process for you this time. I really hope it is. Yeah, we um, uh, we learned we learned some lessons last week, and I think we've all. I think it'll be better. It'll be less work. Hopefully, it sounded good, decent to our listeners. I'm not going to tell you how many hours I worked on it, <laughs> but it like was all this of them. Many? Oh, wow. Is it? Uh, keep you keep going. No, it was it was a lot. <laughs> wow. I didn't I, I didn't have a Saturday next week. Last week, let's put it that way. Wow, <laughs> was, that's insane. It was Dedication. intense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we appreciate that. Um, but one of the things that uh, we said last week to this week is we're going to talk about. This show called Tiger King, uh, the new Netflix sensation. And so let's go ahead and, and talk about that real quick. Um, gentlemen, uh, thoughts on Tiger King? We just finally, my wife and I finished it uh, two days ago. Ryan, uh, Magic Man, I think you guys finished it last week. Yeah, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yesterday. Okay. Yeah. And then producer Brian, you are two episodes in. I, yeah, I just, I watched enough so I could maybe talk about it, but I probably haven't watched enough to have any kind of real grasp of what's happening. <laughs> you need to watch the whole thing. I <laughs> uh, don't want to watch the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so can, can somebody give us a synopsis of the show? Uh, Mojo, I think you, you've seen it all the way through. Of course, we all, all have, you're more eloquently speaking. So give us a rundown of the show. F and Carol Baskin. <laughs> no, um, so here, here it's just the show when you kind of see it pop up, like on the Netflix header, you know, you don't, uh, you kind of bypass it. You see this like uh, weirdo looking dude with pier- face piercings and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, bleached out mullet. And you're like, man, that, that's going to be interesting. But, uh, I think, you know, you scroll over to Netflix and all of a sudden the preview starts playing. And I'm like, all right, this, we might have to just try this out. And I like documentaries. I'm kind of weird like that. So, um, we, my wife and I started watching it and you're immediately sucked in the first episode. They did a great job of baiting you into watching <laughs> the full show. It's like the, the show we talked about. Don't F with cats. It just, mm-hmm. it, it brings you in. So basically the premises is, is you have, uh, it's kind of an expose on the inner workings of these quote unquote tiger sanctuaries or tiger zoos, big cat zoos across the country. And there's quite a few of them. I didn't realize, I know we have one up the road here in North Carolina called tiger world. Um, yeah. There, there's uh, basically these private owned zoos. Um, there, you know, a lot of the zoo owners will talk about how um, there's only, you know, less than, a thousand tigers or whatever in, in, in the wild, but in, you know, there's more tigers actually in captivity being raised by these handlers. So they're actually helping continue the population, you know, from extinction. Um, but we quickly see that these, um, you have two sides of the factions. You have the quote unquote for profit and the quote unquote not for profit. Um, but the document does a great job of setting up who are the protagonist and the antagonist. And you, everyone will have, someone that they kind of gravitate gravitate to as their favorite character or you know you'll be pointing at someone who's guilty more guilty than the others but it, it, the most fascinating thing is that the most forgettable characters like one of the most forgettable characters in the show is a drug kingpin who is actually indicted on murdering a, a, a DEA agent on his own property you forget about this guy He's he's just unforgettable because you're so drawn to the main characters of uh, uh, Joe Exotic and his uh, uh, band of merry men and um, Carol Baskin and her sardine oil loving uh, uh, husband and husbands and uh, the guy from South Carolina, the Myrtle Beach area. They're all just such interesting people. That you just automatically, you, you, I don't know. It's, it's like going to a flea market on acid on a Saturday. Oh yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you're just drawn in by so many things. I, I I can't. I don't know. 
I don't want to give too much away because yeah. producer Brian hasn't seen sure. it yet. And I'm sure don't I'm sure there's it. probably two other people in America besides producer Brian that haven't seen it. Let it listen to this podcast. So mm. you know, I don't want to give it away, but man, it is, it is not, it does not end the way you think it will end. I mean, you just, it's, it's an amazing show. And I heard there's a season two coming. I've, I've I, never. Oh, is, oh no. Wait, okay. you heard there's a season two coming. I can't be right. How, oh. how can that be? Cause. Oh, it could be. One well, of the characters finished, incarcerated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, spoiler alert. Well, they uh, did that well, in the first episode. He's calling a phone from jail. So yeah, no, well, you don't <laughs> yeah I mean, that was the whole premise of the show. Uh, well, I'm sure. I mean, you got, there's so many angles though, that it could take. Um, it, it, I've never experienced a show. I'll say this, that there's not one redeemable character in the entire documentary. There's not one person that I'd say, I think I'll trust this guy. There's, there's no one. I've never seen that before. Usually there's like, oh, that guy I kind of like. The only guy that I kind of liked was their campaign manager. That's the only guy that I thought He's was actually only, yeah. decent. He, was the, he, was, he ran Joe Exotic's Libertarian <laughs> Presidential Gubernatorial Mayoral Campaign. And he was an ammo manager at Walmart. He's the most <laughs> likable character. Oh, this is what I... Well, what about is, the guy with the... The guy with the legs that were, I, he was missing the legs. He seemed pretty all right. Well, no. until he pulled up in a slingshot with a skeleton as a passenger. That kind of creeped me out a little bit. So, yeah. <laughs> and and the fact that he, remember he, him saying, like, if this thing goes down Waco style, I'm going with it. Remember, like, he said that. Oh, So, like, yeah. that was, I, like, okay, he's out. He's out of the game. I, w- uh, I guess I was thinking characters. about the end of the, the, end of the, the series because, you know, they had the, to, you know, doing the follow up with all the characters, and it was just, uh, he seemed like he pretty level headed. He was working in a shop or something now, but yeah, mm. I see what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> Guys, he's just that, trying to get a leg had... up in the world. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. This is how I picture like everybody watching the show. Like, I, I feel like, like Jess and I, like, I lived in Kentucky, so I, like, I've seen weirdos, and I've, and I've dealt with weirdos like okay um so jess and i are watching like wow mouths open like all right i could see how this happens uh magic man i can see his mouth agape as well eyes wide open like i i can't believe this has happened i feel like producer brian is under the covers watching this thing hoping that it ends at any point uh, and then I feel like Mojo is like, that reminds me of last Tuesday. That's like, a, <laughs> my, that's like my last Christmas dinner at my grandma's house. That's Uncle Larry. And, right. <laughs> In fact, I even, while you were going to get some, a beverage, I said, you kind of look like Joe tonight uh, with your hat on and, and whatnot. Well, I, I'm just, uh, I, I'm waiting. To, I, I need to dig through my closet and see if I have one of those paramedic jackets I can just dig out and... <laughs> If some, you know, if if the crap right. hits the fan at the house and the, <laughs> one of the girls gives the boo boo, I got the paramedic jacket on. Can can we point out that scene? So, producer Brian, I don't know if you if you got it to this point, um, but at at one point, one of the um, one of the employees will say of the park got <laughs> got her arm ripped off by the tiger. Yeah, that that was episode at, two. Okay, so that was it. And then his yeah. first thought, Exo- Joe Exotic's first thought is, I've got a bomber jacket that is going to fit this scenario perfectly. Let Perfect. me go get that. <laughs> and then he comes back, and then he has the audacity to tell all the people in the park, with a straight face, mind you, by the way, a woman just got her arm ripped off. If you guys want to go, I'll give you your money back or a coupon to come back. <laughs> I mean, the con- the, yeah, the constant the whole- good business. Yeah, businessman. Yeah. D- he just- wasn't phased by that at all. Right. Like, man, she just got her arm ripped off. It's okay. I mean, he was worried about people not coming back because of that. Right. He was, he was saying yeah, that. He goes, I don't know how I'm going to financially business. recover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Thanks for being that, your your first thought. No, I appreciate that. It, it was just 
a complete dumpster fire, but you couldn't stop watching. Was there any other point of the episode or the show that you're just like, I can't believe this just happened? Oh, uh, yeah. which episode? Just about every, just about everyone, right? Oh man, I mean, evidently polygamy is a theme and theme with uh, tiger park owners, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, crazy. Yeah, I think the doctor, he, like, he needs his own show because that's a whole yeah, another and, thing. And you heard what his doctorate was in, right? Um, mystical medicine, arts, mystical yeah, arts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Y'all. that's legit. I, I wish he was practicing on the front lines of uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak right now with his mystical. Oh, that would be, good. That'd be phenomenal. Yeah. And I mean, the I think the other. The other person that I think is horrible that wasn't even filmed on the the episode was the guy who dropped off his daughter that's a senior in high school and yeah. said, don't fall in love with the boss. That, to me, is the, probably the worst character oh. in the entire thing. Who does that? Y'all. Yeah. Mm. We need, I would love to have mm. one of the people from that documentary on the show. It just they hear the tales. Yeah. yeah, I think they're all busy right now. But, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, the, they're all the, facing the best, prosecution. One of the best things to come out of this, though, is all the Tiger King memes. I mean, they just oh, they keep on rolling out, and it is it's phenomenal. I mean, whoever I'm trying to come up with one for the shop, but it, it, they're, they're just <laughs> awesome. You know, I mean, like I'm gonna tell. Yeah, my, I think one of my favorite ones is that it has uh, Joe Exotic and his, his husbands, and it has like I'm gonna tell my uh, kids this was Florida Georgia Line. I think you know things like that. It's just <laughs> those are the phenomenal memes. So, so. And, and and also, who in the world, um, would like have two gay husbands yet? They're both straight. Like, I don't understand that process. Well, meth does a funny thing, evidently. Uh, yeah. yeah. It uh, drugs. Evidently. I guess the, current, the, currency of, uh, the currency of swinging both ways is meth, evidently, in Oklahoma. And smoking the devil's lettuce. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, so I just finished the, the second episode, which is titled Cult of Personality. That's the title, and it basically is going into the persona of all the people and how they just get sucked in by these cat guys, I guess, or even the lady. Like, I, yeah, they're all like just hypnotized <laughs> to do anything, yeah. you know, with the hours they work and the, what they actually get compensated, getting meat out of the back of a truck to eat, you know, like the Walmart scraps. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, about they're the making Walmart the pizza scraps. Yeah. yeah, they're making the pizzas out of that stuff. Yeah, so and maybe it's okay. I don't know, but they're getting out of a box truck in in Oklahoma in the summer, right? <laughs> I can only imagine. So you know, two two episodes in, my takeaways are: I'm never going to be alone with a cat person again. Oh, like, sure, that's a good point. Like if you if you have if you're a cat person, you're you're crazy. I love okay? you. They're all crazy. Does, is it just big cats or just cat people? No cats, in cats, feline. Okay. If, you, if you're one of those, there's cat people. And yeah. you know who you are. Yeah. Uh you're you're crazy. I'm sorry. Yeah. All um, of you. Is it is anyone look to see if Amazon sells sardine oil in like a fifty five <laughs> gallon drum? I'm just <laughs> curious. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And the fact that she's being accused of feeding her ex husband to the tigers, and then later somebody else gets accused of harming or trying to get Joe Exotic eaten by tigers. And then she says, but, you know, if you use sardine oil, that's really what you should be using. Like, to me, that also kind of goes to prove that she might have done it. Well, I did see a... Go ahead. I saw a headline today that said that uh, like a sheriff's office in Florida is excited because people are getting curious about what happened to that dude now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they're actually re- trying to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, they've actually reopened the case. So it should be interesting to see if they actually have any fruition that develops out of this, you know, the interest and stuff out of the show. But 
Yeah, rightfully so. I mean, the guy, uh, it's quote unquote, her husband ran away or is missing. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Um, would it, thumbs up, thumbs down, would you encourage people to see it? Magic Man, thumbs up, thumbs down. I, I don't know if I could say thumbs up or thumbs down. I would tell about it and then give them a warning and say, watch sure. at your own risk. <laughs> That's also a good point. Mojo? Oh, I'm definitely thumbs up. I mean, everyone should everyone should see this horror with their own eyes. I mean, <laughs> you know, it just it, we're thinking about rewatching it just because I'm sure there's all kinds of little, you know, golden nuggets, not to speak of exotic Joe, Joe Exotic's uh, husband, but, you know, there's some, there's some nuggets out there probably that we missed in, in the whole thing, so. Yeah, also, at the funeral, at his his husband's funeral, he kept talking about that nobody has seen his nut. Like everybody has seen his nuggets. Like who yeah. says that at a funeral? By the way. Well, I, um, I think I think going back to the cult of personality thing. That's that's his personality. He everyone's there for the Joe Exotic show, not for the other sure. reason. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that he also dressed up as a priest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I would also side with Magic Man is the fact like. As you should watch this, but one, definitely not in front of kids. Um, two, probably also not in front of your in-laws or your parents. Um, and and three, by your spouse and only uh, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, I would not be streaming this thing so that everybody can hear because um, there's some there's some words and whatnot. So just be careful when you watch it. Um, how you, how are you going to stream this? Wreck. How are you gonna str- how are you gonna stream this in public when we can't go out in public? So, oh, that's a good point. You can <laughs> you can stream it all you want outside because there's nobody out there. That's right. So there's that. Hook Line and Heroes is a 501c3 nonprofit based in Charlotte, North Carolina, founded in 2017 to show God's love and appreciation for our disabled and PTS military veterans. They provide professionally guided fishing trips to nominated veterans at no cost to the veteran. Hookline and Heroes has provided over 30-plus trips around the Carolinas since their founding, from red fishing down in Charleston to striper fishing on Lake Norman, and even offshore fishing down in Florida. Each trip is a one-on-one experience with a member of the organization aiming to provide a day of fun and relaxation on the water and begin a lifelong relationship with them. Each veteran leaves the day with a fully stocked tackle box, rod and reel, apparel, a Bible, in a daily devotion to kick to kickstart their new hobby and build their relationship with God. Please take the time to visit their website at hooklineandheroes.org to hear and learn more about them. You can help in many ways by nominating a veteran you know through their website, join their monthly giving program, Healing Heroes, or send a one-time personal or corporate donation. You'll also be happy to hear that they are completely volunteer-run and nearly 100% of your donations goes directly towards providing trips for the veterans. Be sure to follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to see their veteran stories and to show your support. Welcome back to the Southern Fly Philosophy Podcast. Tonight's episode, we have our guest on. I've actually been looking forward to it. I stumbled upon this podcast um, a month ago, two months ago, and it's been a treat going back and listening to all the back episodes, but it's called the history of English podcast. You can find uh, them on the interwebs at history of English podcast.com. Also, wherever you listen to your podcast, you just put in uh, history of podcast.com. You can find that Kevin Stroud is the uh, narrator, researcher, head developer, head bottle washer uh, with this podcast. And man, it's just interesting. So Kevin, Welcome to the show, and just kind of give a little a better brief scenario than I did butcher uh, your show there. Well, I mean, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. The uh, you know, it's it's the name is on the tin. You know, it's the history of English podcast. But I think anybody that listens to the podcast will realize pretty quickly that it's you know it, it's a lot more than that. I always say it's the linguistic history of the Western world. But I always try to tie it back into the history of English. So, you know, the podcast begins about four or 5,000 years ago with the ultimate ancient ancestor of English, which is called 
Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European. And I just kind of trace it out from there. You know, that that language was the ultimate ancestor of almost all the languages of Europe, not just English, but I mean, almost all the languages that are not all, but almost all the languages of Europe. And so by tracing out that history, I, I'm able to trace out all the various language groups like, you know, the Greeks and the Romans and the Celts and the Germanic tribes, and then ultimately bring it all together in English. And that's really the idea behind the podcast. I always say it's really a history podcast, uh, more so than a language podcast. It just happens to be a, a history podcast about a language. I've always had a fascination early on as a kid. I guess probably my earliest fascination was, <laughs> probably, I hate to admit this, but when I grew up in a very evangelical Pentecostal, I uh, would beat my head in, in with the Bible. Uh, if we're saying like words like darn or dang it, anyway, uh, parents would always say, don't say the curse words in the Bible. And then you start doing researching, you find out that there's no curse words really in the Bible. That there's, <laughs> not the, there's not the four unmentionable words. And then you kind of start going down these rabbit trails of where these words originate from. So I've always been fascinated with like our, our nomenclature and, uh, just our language where we, where we get it from. And, uh, so anyway, I, when I came upon your podcast, it was kind of a happy surprise. And man, you've been doing it for a decade almost. I mean, it's it's crazy. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the first doing it. the first episode was in 2012, but I actually worked on that podcast uh, for a year before I ever recorded an episode. Just in terms of doing research and structuring it and figuring out how I was going to present it. And so it uh, really began in 2011. So yeah, it's been almost a wow. decade. And so I, I was, that's been one of the, the good things about the podcast is that I was uh, kind of in on the ground floor before there were a lot of podcasts. So I was able, you know, to, to build up a, a, an audience pretty early on. And fortunately, most of them have stuck with me through the years. But yeah, that was real a real benefit of doing it. Of course, I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I started, and I still barely know what I'm doing. But uh, but it, yeah, it's been a, a a lot of work, and I've I've never skipped a month. I started off doing it every two weeks, and then it became every three weeks, and you know now it's every four weeks. But I've never missed a month in those eight nine years, whatever it's been. Kevin, what's your background <clears throat> like? How did you decide this is what I want to do a podcast on like where did you get did, well where did you my get background your research? is actually how did it all start for you uh political science that's my degree and then I'm a, I'm a practicing attorney so I have a law degree as well but uh I actually don't have a degree in either English or history and that was another good thing about starting the podcast so early on when there when there weren't that many people doing them it was very informal and, you know, the, the people who were doing particularly history podcasts, at least as far as I could tell, they weren't academics or authors. They were just people that had an interest in a topic and enjoyed talking about it. And so uh, I just kind of had the idea, you know, for the podcast. But as far as my, my research, um, I mean, I was exposed to some of this when I was in college and had a little bit of a background in, in some of the basic concepts and ideas behind the history of English. but you know, 95% of it is just my own research. I'm an avid book collector. I know where pretty much every used bookstore is within a hundred mile radius of where I live. And through the years, I've just accumulated a massive library, personal private library. Fortunately, they're all used books, so it didn't cost me that much money. But um, but I do most of my research by book, the old fashioned way. Uh, you know, I, I have an, you know, an online subscription to the Oxford English Dictionary, and that helps out a lot. But most of it is just the old-fashioned way, pouring through books, anything related to the history of English or the history of, of England or Western Europe, anything that might tie in to, to what I do. And I'm just an, you know, an avid reader and take diligent notes. I, I always condense all my notes into a word processing file that I re refer back to, and I'm still working from the same file that I began nine years ago. So you can imagine how big that file is. But I, I just keep, you know, constantly adding <laughs> little notes and information into it and, and just kind of go from there. How long does it take to get all the research for just one episode? Yeah. 
I would say the research itself, depending on the episode, is a good two weeks of two to three weeks. Uh And then the the last week is spent actually writing, preparing the episode. And then the last day or two I spend, you know, recording it and then editing it and posting it. But the bulk of it is research. That's one of the reasons why it's taken me longer to do episodes now when it started off, off at two weeks and then three and then four. Um, when I first began, I said I did a lot of research in advance, and that allowed me to, you know, I had a lot of the research done so I could prepare an ep- episode every couple of weeks. But eventually, I caught up to my research. And so now I'm kind of doing a lot of the research simultaneously, and it slowed me down a little bit, but it is a very research heavy podcast. It, it, that's the bulk of my time is spent doing research. That's amazing. It takes us about two to three minutes to throw this crap together. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's a, it's a different, I do a different kind of podcast. And, and some days I trust me, I'm envious of what you guys do. Uh, it'd be much easier for me just to sit down and talk. But the thing is, because of the audience I have for the podcast, you know, they're, they they love it by and large. They appreciate what I do, but they're also very particular. Mm. If I make any mistake, uh, and there's a lot of information packed into my episodes, my episodes are an hour plus in length. There, there's no advertising. There's no really no fancy production. It's pretty much just me talking. And if I make any mistake, I hear about it. Even even a, a mispronunciation, <laughs> which gets us into talking about accents but uh but yeah anytime i make any mistake i hear about it so i'm i try to be as precise and accurate as i can and that means again a lot of preparation and doing the research in advance i mean i still make mistakes but you know i try to minimize them yeah that please don't tell your listeners to listen to us because we make mistakes that's all we do is make mistakes <laughs> and then we, try, we may get one Every, or two episodes. everybody makes mistakes <laughs> Yeah, everybody makes mistakes. But the thing is, that was what I didn't realize, because like I said, I always thought of what my podcast is a history podcast, Mm -hmm. not a language podcast. And of course, that was kind of stupid, because I realized that half of my listeners are are people who like the history, and the other half are people who like the language. And the people who like the language are the ones that will nail you on any mistake you make about language. If you, again, any mispronunciation, any terminology that's used incorrectly, I, I... Anytime I post an episode, I just sit back and wait for the emails because I know I'm going to get them. And I do. I get them almost every episode. I can give you my email address. I just, uh, we have all our hate mail email forwarded to me, so that's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, do, get a, you get a thick skin after a while. I do have uh, PTSD from uh, when you were talking about Jeffrey Chaucer and Canterbury Tales in the opening monologue for that with the Old English. I had to recite that. I had to memorize that. For my, uh, I think my ninth grade English final exam. Mm-hmm. So I had I had PTSD for that. So I just I just now got over it. So I've been able to move on. But I appreciate that recap. I don't remember having to learn the original. Did you have to learn the original Middle yeah. English? Oh, middle man. English. Yeah. yeah well, was... I I remember when I was. I think we also did it in ninth grade. But we actually did a play where each each one of us in the class had to be a character in the Canterbury Tales, and we had to recite in front of an, a, an auditorium, uh, you know, a, a basically a, a monologue or an excerpt. I don't even remember. I don't even remember who I was. But that's, that's scarred in the back of my mind as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I do in the podcast is I try to read the text in the original language. So whether it be Middle English or Old English, and uh, and that's... It's kind of fun. I mean, that's one of the good things about doing this in a podcast format. You can actually hear what the language sounded like as it evolved over time. And I think that's one of the real benefits of of doing it in this format as opposed to reading it in a book. But that that poses its own challenge, you know, just trying to get the the pronunciations as as accurate as you can get them. And they're not perfect, but at least I'm in the ballpark. But the good thing is that now, having gotten through Chaucer, I'm I'm now getting closer to a form of English that I don't have to struggle so much because we're getting we're getting, we're getting close to modern English, and so I, you know I don't have to worry as much about the pronunciations, but um, it's still a lot of fun doing that. Just to give you a visual of my uh, my uh, ninth grade English teacher, her name was Miss Patterson, and you have, have you seen uh, Tiger King yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't. Okay. 
She was one of the mistress. She's one uh, of the mistresses of uh, Doctor Angels. Oh, no. <laughs> did, but did but, she? Uh, <laughs> did she have all of her teeth? <laughs> she did have all her teeth, and she. Okay, I think yeah. she fancied herself as Shakespeare, Shakespeare's probably mistress. You know, in, in her own mind. So uh, she made English horrible. So yeah, thanks, Miss Patterson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to give credit to my uh, ninth grade English teacher because that was the first time, before we talked about Chaucer, I remember this, and I, I remember very little of my high school experience because that was, for me, over 30 years ago. But I remember specifically one day we were talking about Beowulf, and she brought in the, uh, the, the TV with the VCR because there were no DVD players back then, yep. and she put in a videotape, and it was somebody uh, speaking. Beowulf reciting it in the original Old English. And that was the first time that, that I'd ever heard it, to my knowledge. And I couldn't believe that it was English. And I think that triggered something in the back of my mind, because I still remember that to this day. But that, you know, that idea of uh, the language that was so unrecognizable being, you know, just an early form of the language we speak today, it's just always stuck with me. And uh, I know we, we're probably going to talk a little bit about southern accent because that's you know ties into what you guys do but uh but in in many respects the southern accent we have today can be traced back to the accent to one particular accent that was spoken in old english during the time of beowulf and i mean we can talk about that but but that's you know to me one of the most fascinating things about uh the evolution of language is just how 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 it's constantly changing and it just it never stands still, and it changes so much over time. The the rule general rule is over the course of a thousand years, a person speaking the language at the beginning of that period would not be able to understand a period a person speaking the same language at the end of that period. And if you think about the Latin and the Romance languages, it kind of works the same way. You know, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, they all evolved out of Latin, a more or less common language, but a thousand years later, you know, they're all distinct languages. So to me, that's just always been fascinating. No, absolutely, but also, you know, listening. You can, if you listen to probably ten episodes, you know, of, of your podcast, I think people will have a new appreciation that language is a universal global export. This is that's probably our best commodity as hum, the human race is our language, and um, you make you give a great, um, you lay it out for everyone to see that. Uh, we we just have so many commonalities from uh, certain words to phrases to you know like father potter uh, with common words that just cross all types of ethnic groups country boundary lines uh, languages I mean, it, that's one thing that I really is a great takeaway is that it just brings back home that globally we're all we're, we're still pretty much a close family if, if we just right. dissect our language a little bit. Well, that's again that goes to part of the idea behind the podcast, even though I call it the history of English, it took me, I think, 27 episodes to actually get to English because I wanted to start it with the Indo-Europeans and trace it out from there. And the reason I wanted to do that is because by doing it that way, you get to see how, you know, the, as I said, the Greeks evolved out of that linguistic group, as did the Romans. So Latin comes out of that, the Celtic languages, the Germanic languages, and English has borrowed so heavily from all those other languages that it allows you, once you get that foundation, you can see all the connections between the words we have. I mean, you, you mentioned the example I gave. It's, it's a classic example of father and pater. Father is the English word. Pater is the Latin word. Pater gives us words like paternal, paternalistic. Um, patriarch is even tied into that. And so what you start to realize is we have all these words that mean father, but we pronounce them differently, and suddenly you realize, oh, okay, it's really the same word. It's just two different versions of it. If you go back in time far enough, you get to see that, oh, it's the same word. It's just evolved through two different language families over time. And this happens across the board. That The, the P to F sound change that you see there is everywhere. You have a fire in English. And a funeral pyre in Latin, same word, just again, once you account for that sound change. And there's really about a half a dozen of those basic sound changes that were identified by Jacob Grimm of Grimm Brothers fame. Um, and once you can account for those, 
you suddenly just see all these connections in English words that you never saw before. And again, that's the thing that, that makes it so, so fascinating. And again, English is just the perfect language to do it with because English has borrowed you know, so heavily from so many different languages. I mentioned Old English. We only have about 15% of the vocabulary of Old English. The other 85% has disappeared. Now, that 15% is the core vocabulary of our language. It's the words we use the most often. It's our body parts, our close family relations, father, mother, brother, sister. It's numbers. It's basic words for plants and animals. But, but that's about it. Almost all of our other words come from Latin or Greek or somewhere else. So we have this fascinating language we don't even really realize we have uh, that, that borrows so heavily from other places. And so many of those loan words are just different versions of the words we already have in the language. You know, you're, you're mentioning that um, it, if you start out with like a language and, and give it a thousand years, that you wouldn't be able to recognize it in a thousand years. Or the people in a thousand years would not be able to recognize the original version of it. Do, are are we seeing an expedite expedition? Or, I can't talk. I can't use English on the my own podcast. <laughs> are are we seeing this expedite um, here with with technology in the modern modern verse? You know, are we seeing more maybe even a de evolution of of language with texting and stuff? Because I mean, kids have shorthand for everything now. I mean, are we yeah. seeing that now? I'm not convinced of that. I, I, I've heard that argument before. And again, this is where I'm not a professional linguist, so I kind of uh, defer to the experts on that. But my sense is that the language is always expanding and evolving. In, in any, at any given time, there are, are new words coming into the language, and there are old words dropping out of the language. And what's fascinating is right now, the English language is being bombarded with words related to technology, computer, internet. I mean, we're talking about a podcast. Podcast is a brand new word in the language. It's only been around for a few years. Most of the words related to podcasting, you know, internet, computer, technology, all that, those are relatively new words, uh, but we're dropping old words at the same time. But overall, uh, experts will tell you that the vocabulary of the language is expanding over time. That doesn't mean we all use all those words. But we're, we're constantly, um, the language is evolving. I don't know that we can say it's necessarily growing or shrinking. It's just, it's just changing. And that's what it always does. It's always changing. And that, that gets back into the idea of history. If someone doing the history of the English language three centuries from now will go back and talk about how in the, the late 20th and early 21st century, English was again, bombarded with all these words related to technology, which reflected what was happening in the culture at the time. And that's the same thing I do when I do a podcast episode. I look at what was happening in the culture at any given time, what was happening and how that was influencing the language, how new words were coming in at that time based on whatever was happening at that particular time. Uh, I just finished a series of episodes on cooking in English. Uh, and uh, the first cookbook comes out about the same time that Chaucer's writing, and it's fascinating to see all the words related to cooking that came in around the same time from French, because English has a very heavy French influence, you know, in Middle English. Um, and and again, you see the same thing. I did a whole episode on words related to bread, and uh, you just see word after word after word related to the same idea. And it's it's not that, you know, is, is, is there, there's any genius on my end as far as figuring out the connections. It's just what was happening in the culture at the time. Uh, these words were coming into the language because uh, English cuisine was changing at the time and was borrowing a lot of new words, you know, from from French cooks in the in the kitchens of the manor houses of England. So, again, that's just the nature of language it's constantly changing and evolving. I'm convinced that at some point we're just going to skip language or words all together and just go back to emojis. I'm, I'm thinking that's what's going <laughs> to <Flicking. happen. laughs> Well, if, if that happens, somebody else can do a history of emoji podcast. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to get ahead of the curve on good. this one. Dive into the uh, Southern accent part. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Well, this is, 
Yeah, this is fun to talk about because since my podcast is chronological, I haven't gotten to the Southern accent yet. I haven't gotten to modern English yet, so it's kind of fun to delve into it. But um, one of the interesting things I said is you can trace the Southern accent back in time. And let's be clear, I'm saying Southern accent. There's not one Southern accent. There are many different Southern accents. But uh, but if we kind of lump them together and look at some common features, we can generally trace it back uh, to the language that was spoken in and around the Virginia colony very early on uh, during the period of you know colonial the early colonial period. What a lot of people don't realize is that when the, the thirteen colonies and even before there were thirteen colonies, when when North America was settled by the English. People tend to think that people from England just kind of came over and settled in a random manner. And that isn't necessarily what happened. What tended to happen is people from certain parts of England settled in certain parts of the New World in North America. And, for example, if you, if you go northward and look at Massachusetts uh, and, and the, the Plymouth Colony there, most of the settlement came from the southeastern part of England, or what they call East Anglia in that area. But when you look at the Virginia colony, which was the other major colony early on, most of the settlement came from southern England, southern and mm. southwestern England, what they call the West Country. And so the, the bulk of the settlers who came to the Virginia colony came from the, that part of England, and they brought that accent and dialect with them. And if you know a little bit about England, you'll know that England has tremendous variation in accents and dialects, almost from town to town. But the southern and southwestern part of England was once uh, part of a separate kingdom called Wessex. If you go back about 1,200 or 1,300 years ago, there was no England. There were several different independent kingdoms. And in the, the, the one in the south of England was called Wessex, and it had its own distinct dialect. And, uh, and over time, as you get into the Middle English period, it just became known as, linguists call it the southern accent of England. But, you know, coincidentally, southern accent there. But a lot of those features came over. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the, the Wessex dialect, which, by the way, was the standard written dialect of Old English, the late Old English period, because the kings of England were Wessex kings, the, the initial kings. Mm, and the capital of England was, was Winchester, which is in the, not London. London didn't become the capital till later. The capital was Winchester in Wessex. So all the, the scribes who wrote for the, the crown wrote in that dialect. Well, one of the interesting things about that dialect is that it used a lot of diphthongs, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that instead of using a simple, basic, short vowel it broke the vowel up into basically two different vowels put together. So the vowels were stretched out. So you have in, in that dialect, the word heaven is, uh, is spelled typically H-E-O-F-A-N. F represents the V sound there. Don't worry about that. But it's more like heaven, heaven. So it's stretched out instead of heaven, heaven. Seven was seven. So you can kind of hear that stretched out sound that you would have heard in that dialect. And this was carried over uh, in, into the Middle English period and brought over to the Virginia colony. And it's where today people talk about the Southern drawl. Uh, Southerners talk slow. Well, what they're really doing is just using a lot of these uh, diphthongs. They're, they're breaking those basic vowels in, into two separate vowels. And, but that's a characteristic that you can trace back to Wessex, you know, over 12, 1300 years ago. And I'm not saying the Southern accent is identical to the Wessex, but it's, it's the same features came through. In fact, in, uh, in the mid 1800s, there was a, uh, a book that was composed in different parts of England. The Song of Solomon is one of the books of the Bible, and it was, uh, it was transcribed in the different regional dialects of England. And there was one version written in the in the Sussex dialect, which is part of this Wessex region. It's in the south of England. And the, the author who uh, wrote that included in, in his notes that the vowels are pronounced very long in that accent so that an A sound is pronounced like there's a U on the end. So instead of taste, it was taste. Uh, or instead of goat, the O sound also had an extended sound. So uh, instead of goat, it was goat. Boat was boat. 
So again, you get that kind of stretched out sound that you would sound very familiar, you know, to a Southern accent. Um, and interestingly, that that translation of Song of Solomon, you find uh, a lot of interesting features. Words like they, them, their, the is day, dim, dare, duh, you know, all with a D at the end, at the beginning instead of the TH sound. So this and that instead of this and that. Uh, instead of your, it was your. Instead of get, it was git, G I T. Instead of saying I am, it was I be. That sound familiar? Uh, instead of they were, it's transcribed as they was. Uh, instead of children, it was children, children. Uh, so again, a lot of these things, you can kind of imagine an older form of the Southern accent, how that would tie in. Uh, and this kind of continuing this idea, that particular accent, which is Sussex is kind of in the south central part of England. And in that dialect, we find words like flapjack. Okay, and this is going Come on. back to 1700s, 1800s. Uh, instead of his, we find hisen. H-I-S apostrophe N, hisen, instead of his. Um, here's one that my granddad used to use before he passed away. Instead of saying helped, H-E-L-P-E-D, helped, he would say hope. And I could never figure out why he said that. Well, I figured out later it's because it comes from Middle English, and it specifically comes from that dialect that people would say you know, hope instead of helped. Innards mm -hmm. uh, was a common term. Here's a good one for you. Moonshine. Come on. We think of that as a southern one. Moonshine has its origins in the south of England. It, it referred to the fact that at nighttime, when the moon was shining, people did things under cover of darkness they weren't supposed to be doing. So it, uh, it acquired a sense of doing things, you know, illegal or, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, undercover. And of course, in, in North America, it acquired more of the sense of illegal whiskey, but it was actually used for illegal spirits even in england so yeah that's a, that's a term that goes back there um word like skillet goes to that dialect i don't know if you ever hear this one you might hear some older people in the south talk about something being pecked p-e-k-i-d pecked means it's not not right it's a little off mm -hmm. uh that goes back to there and another good one is um unbeknownst mm -hmm. if you hear that it, instead of unknown you get a you get a B stuck in there, and you get an S T ending on it. Unbeknownst, uh, that one goes back. Now that's Sussex. If you move a little bit further westward, still in the south, you get to Hampshire, and there people used words like chitterlings, which becomes chitlins mm -hmm. for entrails. And they used uh, instead of saying worthless, they would say no count. He's a no count S O B, you know, whatever he would say today. Well, that. That was a term that goes back to uh, Hampshire, southern England. If you move a little further to the west, you get to Somerset, and people there would would say holler for a hollow or valley. Holler. Sound familiar? Uh, and mm -hmm. then if you go around that same region in, in what they call in Devon, uh, you people would say, instead of saying yellow, they would say yaller. And instead of saying care, they would say keer, I keer. And instead of saying uh, that they were going somewhere, they would say they were a going somewhere, a going, a dash g o i n, a going. Uh, and then if you move a little bit further northward towards Oxford, now you're in the northern part of Wessex. Some of those regions, Oxford actually is not in Wessex, but some of that those regions. Uh, people called a small animal a varmint. <laughs> and uh, instead of saying garden, they would say garden. Put a little wise in there, garden. And instead of saying chimney, they would say chimbley. <laughs> so you get, you get some of those features coming in as well. Uh, another one that was common, not, not limited to Wessex, was yonder. Down yonder, over yonder. Uh, that, that one was used by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, the Gawain poet who wrote Sir Gawain in the Green Knight used it. That was a very common word in Middle English, goes back to Old English, but it disappeared from a lot of English dialects, but preserved, uh, in, in Southern English. Another good Wessex term, uh, was a mess of greens, <laughs> a mess of greens. 
Uh, that term is literally found in the documents composed in Southern England. Uh, mess was a Middle English word for a serving of food. And we still have that in a term like a mess hall, mm -hmm. you know, serving of food. It's actually where we get the word messy. Because at the end of a meal, there was such mm -hmm. a, a, a mess of scraps <laughs> and food remnants on the table that it became known as a mess or messy. But it goes back to that idea of a serving of food being called a mess. Well, we still use that in, in old-timey Southern English when somebody refers to a mess of greens. Uh, and, a, and another good one for you that you would have found in Old English was instead of someone asking somebody a question, they would ask someone a question. Now, that is actually an Old English pronunciation. Today, we associate it more with African-American speech, but you have to keep in mind that African-American uh, English is itself a, a branch of Southern yeah. English. Mm -hmm. It comes out of Southern English. So, uh, but again, all these features can be traced back to Southern England. Interesting. Can I ask one, maybe one other one that I think is the, the South is notorious for is y'all. Yeah, that's a good one. The problem with y'all is that there's not an agreed history or origin or, or etymology of that word. So let's talk about that one. You know, the, the Oxford English Dictionary cites as its first reference in the early to mid-1800s, uh, it's, uh, it's in reference to slaves teaching white children their terms or, or white children picking up certain terminology from slaves. And it gives the example of, it says, you all. It doesn't say y'all. Anytime that, that word was referenced in, in early English documents, you know, it, it's always rendered as you all. But just that, that combination was considered odd at the time to, to speakers outside of the South. Mm. Then it just started to be rendered as, you know, Y apostrophe A-L-L. But that, that suggested that it was uh, some feature of African-American speech um, maybe mixed in with African speech patterns. And uh, the, the struggle for a um, second person plural pronoun, I'll talk about that in a minute, but, but basically uh, that's the argument. Now, there's a completely contrary argument that says that it actually was brought to uh, the South by immigrants from Scotland and Ireland, basically your Scots-Irish, who settled mainly in the Appalachian region. And in, in Scots, Scots is a sort of a dialect of English. Some people would say it's its own language, but it developed out of Old English in southern Scotland. And there they say ye aw, Y-E-A-W, ye aw, same thing as y'all. Hmm. And a lot of people say that's where it came from. Those two theories are not mutually exclusive. You could have had both happening at the same time, and they kind of met in the middle because the African Americans, the slaves mostly lived in the coastal regions. The Scots Irish mostly lived in the Appalachians. And so, as they kind of came together in the middle, it's conceivable that, that the two words kind of blended together. But having said all of that, though, um, at one time in the 1600s, it was common for um, English women, white English women, to kind of be sold um, as sort of like indentured servants into Virginia Colony to work. Mm. And there were certain um, s servant ballads that survive about that, you know, ser working as a servant in the New World. And this is in the 1600s, and we can find you all being used as a plural pronoun even back then in the South. And that, that, would, that kind of predates these other theories. So the bottom line is no one really knows for certain where it came from, but it, it certainly has become the distinguishing uh, feature of Southern speech. And over time has even expanded a little bit outside of the South, uh, particularly with you know, rap and hip hop. And, and you know, the, it is such a feature of African-American speech as well that that culture has helped carry it beyond the South. And you can you can hear it even in England now. There are people who use it. Of course, the other there there are other competing second person plural pronouns. A lot of people will say "you guys," and I recently had a chance to talk with uh, Alan Metcalf, who has written an entire book about the word "guy." Um, but but it it's creeped into the South. So you'll hear Southerners now say "you guys" instead of "y'all." 
And so there's sort of a competition there between those two terms. And there are many others. You'll hear some people in the South say yens or yuans. That's that's yens is a Pittsburgh age right there. That's a... No, but it, also it's also Virginia or Pennsylvania yeah. area too. You can hear. I think you'll hear it more. Ewans and yens is really the same word. It's just pronounced a little differently or same phrase. I think you'll you'll hear Ewans. My wife's family is from the the Appalachian region, and her, and her they say Ewans a lot. Yens, I think, is the more common. You get into Pennsylvania, but but again, now, now Ewans and yens is definitely Scots Irish. That that one also comes in from there. But you'll hear other variations too. Um, in England, people say "you lot" and different different variations. But what what's happening there? The reason we have all these is because English, <laughs> by if we go by textbook grammar, we have the same pronoun for singular and plural. If I'm referring to you individually, I say "you." If I'm referring to all four of you, I say "you." And this is because English. That happened in early modern English. You know, if you go back to King James Bible, Shakespeare, we know that people have said thee and thou when referring to an individual. You know, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I mean, you're referring to an individual, use thee and thou. Well, those go back to Old English. That was the way English used to work. You was the plural pronoun. So we had a very clear distinction, but that was lost in early modern English. And you pushed thee and thou out of the way, and it left English with the one pronoun for both. And that creates a problem where we're trying to be clear and make that distinction. And since there was no longer a standard accepted plural pronoun distinct from the singular, um, English speakers had to come up with something. And that's why we have this you know, crazy variety today where Southerners say you all or y'all and you guys and yens and you It's It's English struggling to find a way to distinguish the two pronouns uh, where the distinction had gotten lost over time. And uh, who knows, you know, if we're ever going to fi- find one to settle on. Um, by the way, <laughs> pronouns are very unstable in English. Uh, if, you, if you know about... Uh, Putting aside the social aspects of it, it's very common in English to refer to an individual as they. And again, I'm just talking about when we don't know the gender of the person, you know, the, the, the postman came by today and they left me a big package. You know, I, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, so I say they. They would call that the singular they. And that's been around since t- the time of Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, and that's English kind of doing the same thing again, because we don't really have a good gender neutral pronoun. We don't want to say it. It can be offensive. You know, it, it came by today. So we, we <laughs> use they. But what, what we see the same kind of thing happening there, where the, the lines between the pronouns are kind of getting blurred. And we're pulling over that plural pronoun ever. And that, again, I'm not even getting into the modern tendency for people who are you know, non-binary to want to be referred to as they. I mean, that's a whole different issue, but I'm just kind of getting into the fact that our pronouns over time shift around and uh, they're not as clean and neat as we would like them to be. And that's what creates this confusion in the language where we're forced to come up with these other terms like y'all to try to make it clear when we're speaking. Wow. Yeah. I'm sucked in, man. I keep talking. I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I told you that's the reason why I listen to this podcast. So, I, I'm a. I love history. I've always loved history and like the origins of things. And I, I listened to one of your uh, your most recent episode today. I, st- I didn't get through the whole thing, but the, the playing cards episode, right, right? And I didn't know what to expect, you know, because because uh, Brandon has said, "Hey, you know, we should, we should check this podcast out." So I started listening to it. And five minutes in, I, I'm just, I was completely just sucked into the history of playing cards just by, before, as they have <laughs> approach, as they relate to the language and just the things happening around the times and the currency, like everything just totally sucked me in. So it was awesome. <laughs> well, that's, that's the idea. I never like to present a simple, straightforward episode. You know, this, this happened, then this, sure. then this. I always look for ways to uh, make it interesting and, and weave together different storylines at the same time. And so the, the, the episode you're referring to, the most recent episode, 
really is focusing on two events. It's focusing because I, I, I follow, uh, you know, sort of an overall historical narrative, what was happening in England or Western Europe. And then second, secondly, I'm following a separate narrative, what was happening in the language. Well, I'm in the mid-1400s, and the big event that happened in the mid-1400s was Gutenberg inventing the printing press. And so um, also at the same time, it, it literally the exact same time, um, England was losing the Hundred Years' War. And, uh, and so how do you tie those two together? Well, one way to do it is playing cards. Because playing cards, first of all, what a lot of people don't realize is that the printing press it, it sort of came out of uh, playing cards in a weird way. Playing cards became were introduced to Europe uh, from Egypt and then ultimately from China, but they were introduced to Europe in the late 1300s, and they were they were mass produced with block printing. So basically, someone carved out a picture of a playing card on a wood block and then just stamped it over and over and over again. And then eventually what happened, of course, is Gutenberg got the idea of doing the same thing for each individual letter so he could move the letters around and, and make a printer, you know, and, and create a whole book very quickly that way. So, but, but then how do you tie that into the Hundred Years' War? Well, if you know the Hundred Years' War, you know that um, Joan of Arc was a very famous figure. She helps the French fight back and turns the tide and helps, uh, you know, helps motivate the French troops to win that war. Well, one of her main knights uh, and commanders, because she, she was a peasant girl. She didn't know anything about military strategy. So her uh, main knight was uh, Laire. He's known as Laire, a uh, French name, happens to be the person who's credited under French legend with inventing the deck of playing cards that we use today with um the 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 suits that we use today and uh the the structure with the 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 queen and everything else so he was a previously a knight instead of a queen so anyway what that allowed me to do is kind of tie those two stories together and i use that as sort of a jumping off point to talk about playing cards the history of playing cards and how the language has been influenced by playing cards all the all the terminology that we have so yeah, you don't don't get me started on stuff like this because I can go on and on and on. It's awesome. So, do you recommend new listeners to start at the beginning with your podcast? Yeah, I do. I do. It's a it's a chronological narrative, and it really be it uh, it it builds. You know, the first few episodes are like the foundation, and it introduces some basic ideas like these sound changes I talked about earlier, and then it just kind of builds from there, uh, and and it goes. You know, we talk about uh, the alphabet, you bring that into the story. And then again, talk about Latin and, and Greek and all these other influences. And then eventually we get into English, but it's a long, long, long narrative because I, I'm now at 135 episodes, I think. And they're all between 45 minutes to over an hour in length. So I know a lot of people will never listen to the whole thing, but if you can, if you really want a deep dive, I think that's the way to do it. But but again, within the, the way I've structured it is each episode is usually built around a theme, like the most recent episode sure. kind of being built around playing cards. And what that allows you to do is if you don't want to follow that whole narrative, you can just kind of pick out an episode and it's, it's self-contained. Each episode normally has a beginning and ending and, and has a theme that's developed along the way. And I know I have listeners who be, give me feedback, and they just sort of jump around. They don't listen necessarily in, in chronological order. But ideally, yeah, if you could start at the beginning, I think that's that's the best way to grasp the, the information. And I do repeat certain information from time to time that I think is important. But you know, ideally, that's how I would want somebody to listen to it. Cool. Uh, I guess as your podcast catches up to the... Uh obviously the modern English, um, eventually you'll have to come to where we are here today. Where do you see, uh, your podcast going when you catch up to, uh, present? Wow. That's a good question because I, I don't know. That's a, that's an honest answer. I I'm looking forward to getting into the modern English period, but I also recognize the challenge because so far it's been relatively easy to talk about the history of English in Old and Middle English because it's been contained to one place. Basically, England 
a little bit of Southern Scotland. What's getting ready to happen as I move into the next century or two is it, it's expanding outward, North America, Ireland, uh, and then, of course, Australia, New Zealand, around the world. So it's going to be very difficult to maintain that historical narrative at the same time as following out the, the history itself. Um, but my, my goal is to try to do that and it, bring it up to uh, the, the 20th, 21st century and then stop. Um, and, and that's it. You know, and I, I would like to bring it all the way up to where we are today. Because there's still a lot of history being made. A lot of people don't realize that as we speak, there are English daughter languages that are being spoken and, and uh, formed around the world. You have, like in Papua New Guinea, uh, a language uh, there, uh, I think that's where it is, called Talk Pisan, but it basically means talk pigeon, but uh, like pigeon language. But it's really a, a branch of English. And you have others in the South Pacific. You have some in Africa um, that are, you know, we think of Latin fracturing and creating all these daughter languages that we know today as the Romance languages. Same thing happened in the north of Europe with the original Germanic language that fractured and gave us English and German and Dutch and the Scandinavian languages. Well, you could argue the same thing is happening as we speak today with English. That it's become so massive and so expanded around the world that it's also starting to fracture, and you get these little pockets of you know different dialects of English that are popping up, and so it would be fascinating, and I do want to explore that a little bit. In fact, I've done a, a bonus episode about that. I have a Patreon account, but I'd love to get into that a little deeper. Uh, but I'm not, I can't go beyond you know where I am. It's a history podcast, so I'm not, I'm not projecting into the future. But I'm going to try to bring it up as as close to current day as I can. I don't know. I think I think projecting in the future, you could almost take like a the snippet from *Idiocracy* the movie and uh, <laughs> give your forecast for uh, where we'll be in a hundred years. Um, is it Brando? I'm trying to think. Of what yeah, Brando. Yeah. <laughs> it has electrolytes. Uh, that's a good yeah. word. <laughs> yeah, electrolytes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know, I'm looking forward to President Camacho. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Um, on the first episode, you were just talking about how um, how English is so prevalent throughout the world, even in Germany uh, and China. And I think the example you used was a was a car maker in Germany talking to a car maker in China, and they were both using English as the primary um, language there. Do you do you see that English infiltrating some of these other languages and and conforming and, and changing and manipulating their language to make it more English? Well, I think if you asked a lot of people in, in, in other parts of the world, they would say, yeah, that it is happening and mm. it's a problem. And especially if you were to go to, to France, uh, which has very specific rules uh, in trying to keep the French language French, not realizing how much French influence there is in English, but putting, that's a whole different issue. Um, you know, it's interesting because there's tremendous fluency in English in, in Western Europe. It's sort of become the lingua franca, the you know, de facto international language in many respects. And what's uh, especially interesting is to see how that might be affected by Brexit, because mm -hmm. with England now no longer part of the European Union, does that change. There's already some movement in that direction to try to, to take English out, but it's going to meet with very fierce resistance because it's just the language that people know and they're, they're going to use it. Um, and that's interesting as far as how that develops. But there's, there's no doubt that English has infiltrated other languages and continues to do so. Um, I don't think any of these languages are going to disappear in the face of English, mm. certainly not any, any of the major languages. But you'll continue probably to see that influence. It's, you know, it's very much like the history of English itself. The whole story of Middle English is how English was being bombarded with words from French and Latin and, and to a certain extent, Greek, and how it just completely changed the language. Remember, I said that 85% of the words in Old English have, got, have disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that can happen over time if there's a strong enough influence from the outside. And that could certainly chip away at the vocabulary. But, you know, at the end of the day, 
the core vocabulary of a language doesn't tend to change very much. Those basic words you learn as a child, and uh, and those will, will probably stay intact. You know, outside influence doesn't tend to change the grammar of a language very much or the syntax. So these languages will continue on. They'll become dis- they'll they'll remain distinct, but they they'll certainly inqu- acquire a lot of English words over time. But that's just the history of language. And like I said, English has done the same thing over time. It's acquired a lot of loan words. But I don't think these languages will disappear. Mm-hmm. A prime example of that is in India. Um, the company I work for, um, we have basically the, the people that own it and uh, a lot of the people that manage it are from India. And, uh, of course, I've always been under the impression that India, they all speak Hindi and it's a common language in India. And that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. There's I couldn't tell you how many languages there are out there. I, I think there are. Th- Thousands, maybe. Yeah, are, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but the one common one they have is English, and um, I did a, a, a project uh, planning session with several folks from different parts of India, and it was funny to sit there uh, and listen to them asking, "Hey, do you speak this language? Do you speak that language? Do you speak this language? Do you speak mm-hmm. that language?" Mm-hmm. Uh, because they all speak different languages, mm-hmm. but the one that they all speak together is English, right? And of course, that's a unique story, being you know being a former British colony. Um, and and in, in that sense, it's it's given India, you know, despite the, the the some of the bad history there, it's given I think India a little bit of a leg up by in, ingraining the English language into the country and has allowed them, you know, how many times do you call customer service and get somebody in India today? Well, you get that because English is so widely spoken there today, and it's created economic opportunities there, you know, and that, again that gets to this idea of. You know, the influence of English around the world isn't just a cultural influence. It's not just because of movies and television shows. There's simply an economic factor at work mm-hmm. where if you want to succeed in many parts of the world, you need to speak English. And you know, we don't appreciate that, being native English speakers. Um, but that's a, a very you know, heavy pull in other parts of the world. And uh, it's something that's of great value if you're a native English speaker, because you don't you don't necessarily have to learn uh, another language. But it, that you know, the other side of that is it would probably be better if we did speak another language, just to have more of an appreciation uh, for for other languages. But uh, but yeah, there's no doubt that you know that's the case in India. It's, it's true in many parts of the world. One of the fascinating things about that to me is to look at English fluency in Europe. And what you see is that English fluency is pretty high throughout Europe, but it is its highest in places like the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark. And the reason why that is, I mean, you're talking people in the, in the 85% of the people or more are fluent in English. And that makes perfect sense if you understand the history of English. Because all of those languages are closely related to English. They all come from the same branch of the family tree. And if you were to go back, it, it is said, I don't, I'm not, I don't speak Dutch, so I can't confirm it, but it is said that a native Dutch speaker would have a much easier time reading Beowulf in the original language than a native English speaker would. Because um, English has changed so much mm. since then, but Dutch hasn't changed as much. And if you go back a thousand years, English was much closer to Dutch. In fact, Dutch is probably English's net closest relative. And so it makes perfect sense that Dutch speakers would also speak English so fluently. And so there is that correlation. Uh, and that's why I say I, I don't think you're, you're going to lose English as a, as a language in Europe, uh, regardless of what happens with Brexit. Interesting. Kevin, what is your favorite episode so far that you've you released? Good question. I would I'm almost tempted to say the most recent episode because that's the one I've spent all my time on. And that that would be true if you asked me six months from now, it would be the most recent episode, whatever I did. Um the 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 ones I would say that there's one or two that stands out very early on, I think it's episode five. I trace out why the letter C has uh, represents both the the K sound and the S sound in English, and that was a bit of a, a deep dive to start with pretty early on in the podcast. But 
but I decided to do it, and I'm, I think it turned out pretty well. I didn't overly complicate it, but I think if you listen to that episode, it explains why we have a letter C. Because a lot of times, if you're a kid, you're wondering, what the hell's going on with letter C? Why do we need this thing? But, you, but once you see the history, you, you get it. And the reason why that stands out to me is it, it set the, the groundwork for what comes later in the podcast, which is that all the weird things about English, English spelling and grammar, the, the things that make English crazy that were never explained in school. We were just told that's the way you do it. Because frankly, most of the teachers don't know why either. They weren't taught either. They were just taught that's the way you do it. Most of those um, crazy things have a reason. There's a reason in the history of the language why it exists that way. And what I wanted to do in the podcast is try to explain it, why we do that. Mm -hmm. And that one, I think, is very important because it's just a basic, basic thing. But we, you know, I, I, there's so many examples of that in the podcast, but that one stands out. You know, in later episodes, I talk about why we have a leaf that ends with an F, but we have leaves with a V, you know, thief, thieves. I explain why that is. And then, of course, you have crazy English spelling rules. Um, you know, why do we spell some words with an F and others with a PH? Why don't we just use an F? Well, there's a reason for it, because the PH comes from Greek, and it comes in in words we borrowed from Greek, and I try to explain that. So what I'm, trying, what I'm getting at is that most of these weird things about English actually have a reason, and uh, I like that episode because it, it, it explained that, and it laid the groundwork for, I think, what comes after it. Side note, um, do you, I guess you still practice law? Uh, kind of, sort of. Um, I have gradually retired, uh, from the practice of law over the last five years. And, uh, what's happened is about five years ago, my, we lived in the, the Raleigh Durham area. That's where my office was for many years. I practiced about 25 years there. And my wife's family I mentioned is from the mountains. So for people who are not familiar, that's about three hours away. And uh, she wanted to move back home. And I, you know, I said, okay, let's do it. I like the mountains. And so we did. And for a while, I tried as best I could to, to commute when I needed to and do work by phone and email. And I just got tired of it. And I, I focused more and more on the podcast. And it's become my, my job. And, uh, and so now, it, you know, I, I tend to do most of my, most of my time is spent on the podcast. I still maintain my license. I still, in fact, today I was speaking with a client, but, but it's very rare. Um, I no longer even maintain an office in Raleigh. So what I do now is just uh, by phone and, and really mostly just clients I build up over the years who call me and have questions, business clients or whatever. But I, I like to say that I'm semi-retired, but I'm really about 95% retired at this mm. point from, from law. Wow. I got you. So I couldn't retain you for criminal defense. I'm just asking for the future. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it depends on the, the charge. <laughs> um, that, not, what, not only what you're charged with, but what I would charge you to do it. So. Well, I, have, I, have two, I, have two daughter, I have two daughters. So a wise man once told me I always have a, a great accountant, a great alibi, and a great attorney. So they, I'm they always go. constantly looking. For closing arguments, well, we're going to listen to all 135 episodes. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it, it. You know, as I said, when we started talking, I'm not an academic. My my background in English is not as an, an academic in college teaching students about English. My my connection to English came as an attorney having to use the language. And most of what I did was drafting contracts and legal documents. And it's a, it's amazing how much you spend every day focusing on what's the right word. Mm. Where do I end this clause? Do I use a comma here or don't put a comma there? It's just the practical use of the language that you deal with in practicing law. And that was always my interest in, in English. I was never a particularly great English student. I could not stand diagramming sentences or telling you the symbolism of Moby Dick. I don't want to know anything about any of that. I just want to know why does the language work the way it works? Mm -hmm. And and you know, why and that's that's my interest in it and that's how I present it and I think if uh, if anything maybe it's a little bit of an advantage because I don't speak like an academic mm -hmm. I don't use the technical terms I try to break it down into plain regular speech um, and uh, again maybe maybe that's a that's a benefit I don't know but that that's why uh, that's my connection to English. 
Very cool. Well, you guys got anything else? Well, uh, one thing that I do want to bring up, and this is a question that we ask our guests, and Kevin, I gave you some fair warning on this question. Um, this is, uh, how do you make meatloaf brought to you by Watchman Cigars? Uh, and it is a segment that we will ask our guests. Kevin, how do you make meatloaf? Um, very carefully. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I actually, I am a cook. I love to cook. But and I've made meatloaf, mm-hmm. but I haven't made it in many years. Anytime I want meatloaf, um, I go to Cracker Barrel. Okay, they have oh. a very good meatloaf, um, actually. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't have any fancy recipes for you. It's just ground beef and breadcrumbs and green peppers and onions and whatever else you put in there. But uh, I mine mine didn't turn out very well. I made it a couple of times. It turned out <laughs> kind of like a brick, and I never made it again. So uh, I'm not the best person to ask for that. That's quite all right. But the the main point though is you put breadcrumbs in it. So was that's there an for, egg involved? Yes. Was there an egg? I need to know. There okay. was. There that's was. That's all we need to know. An right. egg. Was involved. there breadcrumbs? Was there, there an was. egg? That's a it's a big inside joke, essentially, with one of our it, advertisers. It may have actually. <laughs> it may have been. Uh, it may have been crunched up crackers. Yeah, See, that's, that's what I do better, right there. Works too. There it is. I like it. Well, Kevin, where can people find, uh, one, your podcast, and then uh, your Patreon? Yeah, the podcast is very simple, historyofenglishpodcast.com. And the, the Patreon is uh, patreon.com slash historyofenglish. And uh, it's simple as that. Kevin, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your show. Yeah, I'm sure that they've enjoyed it. And guys, listen, if you want to know, check out the History of English podcast. We really, uh, we really love what he's doing there. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for coming All on. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We want to say again, thank you so much to Kevin for coming on the Southern Fried Philosophy podcast. We've really enjoyed it. Man, I learned so much. Um, and I haven't, I'm like on episode one. So I got to go back and and listen to all 134 now. So I appreciate uh, appreciate that. Mojo, thanks. I'm going to do it in reverse order, I think. I'm gonna oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Do it in reverse <laughs> order. Mojo, thanks for – I don't know how that would yeah, work. Thanks for uh, tuning us into that guy. That was awesome. I can also make you dumber with other podcasts that I listen to also, but I'll save that for another Well, day. you know, we'll shoot for Joe Rogan next week. <laughs> Actually, Joe Rogan is uh, right up there on the History of English podcast, guy. You learn a lot. So. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Anyway, appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, remain safe out there. Avoid the coronas. Uh, wash your hands. Wipe your rear ends. Whatever the CDC tells you to do. Uh, but yeah, speaking of podcasts, we have mm-hmm. one. So make sure you go to the old iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Uh, put in the old magnifying glass, Southern Fried Philosophy. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a like. Give us a review. Facebook page, Southern Fried Philosophy. Website, southernfriedphilosophy.com. April is Donate Life Month. Make sure, if you haven't done that, please sign up to be an organ donor. We appreciate you. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Again, it's your four years plus one, so um, we're we're thankful for all of our organ donors out there. Um, Guys, again, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Producer Brian, thanks for all that you always do. Guys, thanks again. Keep yourself safe. Also, just a side note, you idiots that are, like, going out on the weekends and just, like, playing basketball and being dumb, stop it. Just stop it right now. Stop spreading this thing. I'm tired of y'all. All All right. um, (laughs) And as always, just keep looking up. Go wash your hands.